Hey guys, welcome to Propelio TV. My name is Donovan Ruffin. I'm gonna be going over sales 101. I'm gonna be breaking down the sales uh, tactics that I use to train my sales organization and what I've been doing for the past couple years is train uh, sales reps. Um, we're gonna be diving into the all aspects of the, the body of the pitch, how to close the deal, um, how to structure the pitch. Um, so stay tuned. Propelio TV is sponsored by Noble Mortgage and Investments, Batch Skip Tracing, Think Multifamily, CreativeCastro.com, and Life in Air. good what's up guys um, welcome to Propelio TV my name is Donovan Ruffin um, I run a uh, investment company here in Dallas uh, our office is based out of Addison I'm in Arlington right now I love these guys um, and what I'm gonna be talking about with you guys today is gonna be sales 101 um, this is gonna be just about sales we're not gonna be talking about marketing we're not gonna be talking about markets we're not gonna be talking about acquisitions or I guess it is acquisitions just because it's sales, but I want to be able to give you guys as much value as I possibly can off what I know and what works for my business that's currently working right now. Um, and essentially, this is this is how I train my sales guys um, that I, I'd love to, to share with you guys so you guys can be more efficient when you guys are locking up deals. Um, can we go on the whiteboard? All right, cool. So let's get started. So we're going to call this um, sales one-on-one. -on -one. Sales 101. Cool. So I know there's thousands of videos on sales. I know there's thousands of videos on real estate, on YouTube. You can get access to all this stuff for free. Even this is free. Um, and I wanted to, to do a show that's going to be a little bit different. Um, that's going to add a ton of value to you guys uh, based off what works in my business um, and kind of how I train my sales guys. Um, so the first thing I'm going to go over is going to be the uh, five steps to the conversation um, when you're first approaching your client or customer, um, regardless if it's real estate or even if you're selling a different product, it's still going to be the same concept just because it, it's universal. Um, so from my experience, uh, I started in sales when I was 18. Um, I started my own company when I was 20. Um, I ended up training over thousands of of sales individuals in my own company. Um, and now I have a sales organization in real estate acquisitions um, and dispositions. Um, and we use these same strategies. Um, so we're gonna call this the five factors of impulse. Five factors of impulse. So hang with me guys. All right, cool. So let's talk about the first steps of the conversation. Um, so if you think about um, sales in, in a general aspect, um, there's all different types of obviously products that you can sell, um, different approaches, um, et cetera, et cetera, but you still want to approach every type of sales opportunity um, in the kind of same manner. And what you guys are going to understand throughout this process is um, sales is more than just selling a product and making money. Um, sales has a a contribution to a lot of different aspects in your life um, that you're currently doing just even just to survive make friends um, and I mean associate with friends um, meet people etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and this is kind of the body of kind of how that looks on a general approach um, so the first step is obviously going to be the the preliminaries prelims um, and basically what a preliminary is it's kind of like first impressions right um, so when you first uh, in, initially contact somebody, um, your first impression is, is kind of like everything. Just like in the first 10 seconds of this video, uh, my first impression is everything to, to see if you guys are going to continue watching this. It's the same concept um, when you're talking to your client or customer. So yes, if you're physically with a client or customer, obviously your first impressions is kind of everything. Um, and what I mean by that is you don't want to come into a, a, a situation where your initial approach is, is kind of off, where essentially they don't trust you, they won't listen to you, or they're not interested in what you're talking about based off of your initial approach. Um, and a lot of rookie salespeople and rookie people that have never done sales before, um, this is gonna help you dramatically because sometimes you guys are doing it opposite and backwards, um, and that's why people won't listen to you. So um, just like when you go out and meet a friend, um, you don't just sit there and be like, hey, how can I make money from you? Or it's not like, hey, how can I uh, sell you a product or it's like hey how can I be your friend that's weird you don't you don't uh, uh, initiate a conversation like that so you have to uh, essentially build a relationship with somebody but I would say the easiest way um, to start a conversation with somebody um, on a general approach is just off icebreakers icebreakers and basically what icebreakers are it's a it's a 
it's a, a jab to a different topic other than what you, your focus on the conversation is. So you talk about something completely different, whether it's about politics, whether um, about uh, something that's funny, what college they went to, um, somebody's pet, whatever it is, you want to start a conversation based off something completely opposite um, where you're able to find common ground with people because that's going to be one of the main goals um, when you're um, initially in the preliminary stage. So you have your icebreakers and the goal for the icebreaker is to find common ground. Find common ground. And this is pretty big because a lot of people go through an entire pitch and waste 10, 15 hour um, two hours of somebody's time when they never even find common ground with somebody. That person doesn't even like you. Um, this person's not listening to you. They're not focused on what you're saying just because they haven't connected with you yet. So the main goal in the preliminary is to find that common ground, be able to relate with somebody really quickly and efficiently within that first couple minutes of meeting somebody or initially talking to them. Um, and throughout this entire section, um, there's a couple key points that I want you guys to pay attention to. And one of the main ones is CPR. And basically what CPR is creating a personal, a personal relationship with somebody, which is super, super important because nobody's going to do business with somebody that they don't trust or they don't know. Uh, but on top of that, if they do trust you and if they do like you, it's going to be a lot easier for you to, to move your product or to get them to, to do whatever you want, um, essentially. So if you think about it like this, um, if your mom came to you and or if you have a product or something, it's a lot easier to, to sell a product to your mom because you already have that relationship. She already trusts you, et cetera, et cetera, or a family member or your best friend. Um, so that's kind of what you want to build on the relationship when you're talking to your clients and customers is like, hey, how can I make this person essentially like my best friend where they trust me to the highest extent? So that way, when you're moving your product or you dive in deeper to the pitch, it's a lot easier because that trust factor is there because there's a relationship. Um, and basically what I tell my sales guys is, um, you, you don't really want to jump into essentially like the full blown pitch talking about the product until you've developed that relationship with somebody where essentially you're able to sit down at a restaurant at a later time and you guys are able to be friends and correlate. Um, does that make sense? Or I guess uh, I'm talking to the computer, so it's a little bit different. All right, so CPR um, in the preliminaries, this is gonna be the goal throughout this entire body of the pitch. Um, but preliminaries is the first impressions, you have icebreakers, the goal is to find that common ground. Um, and one of the easiest ways to do this is to also make people laugh. Make people laugh. Um, everybody knows that salesperson that is not funny um, or that is just super weird, super awkward, and it's just a horrible experience because for one, you're not able to connect with them, they're not entertaining, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not saying you have to go be a full-blown comedian, but I'm, I'm just saying find current events, find certain um, statistics on the world or where you're able to connect with people to kind of make them laugh. Um, because as soon as you're able to make somebody laugh really quick, um, the sooner you're able to, to find, hey, I'm connecting with this person. Um, because when you make people laugh, it's more than just, hey, I'm more than just connecting with them, but I'm connecting on, on a, a emotional standpoint. And what I mean by that is when you're able to connect with somebody on an emotional standpoint, um, then you, you can tell that that trust factor is increasing. Um, so continuing, um, so we have CPR, icebreakers, making people laugh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we're gonna move into the second part of the pitch, which is called the investigation. So if you think of police officers, if you ever sat down with a police officer or an investigator, uh, their entire job as a police investigator is to ask questions. And the reason why they ask questions is they ask a ton of questions to try to find and build a case against somebody or try to find a solution. It's gonna be the same concept that we're gonna do here in sales is because we're trying to find areas in which we can help somebody um, on top of the fact is we're trying to get to know somebody in the fact of CPR, creating a personal relationship. Now, remember, we still haven't even mentioned anything about the product that we're selling. Um, you're not talking about houses, you're not talking about ARVs, you're not talking about values. None of that. And if you are talking about that at this point in the pitch, you are wasting your time because you're not going to be that efficient. So in an investigation, obviously you want to ask questions about their personal life. So, hey, where are you from? Or what do you like doing for fun? Or how many kids do you have? What are your kids' names? What do your kids like to do? 
Um, so you have a general approach of trying to get to know somebody just like you would ask one of your best friends or your family members. Because um, remember, that is the goal is to build this trust factor. Um, so yes, you want to ask general questions, personal questions, not too personal where they're like, hey, why are you asking me all these questions? It's more so, hey, I like you, you're a good person, and you're trying to get to know me because you care about me. And essentially, that is what we're trying to do, is we are trying to care about people, we're trying to solve their problems, we're trying to figure out how we can help them. But if we don't ask, we'll never know. So if you don't ask, you're going to be flying off the charts with all these different problems that other people have in different situations. Um, and then there, there could be millions and pro millions of problems um, out there that you're just trying to guess. So we're not trying to guess, we're just trying to find data in which we can correlate to our pitch later on in the pitch. All right, so an investigation is, yes, the main thing that you're doing is you're asking questions. Asking questions. So yes, you want to ask personal questions, um, and you want to continue to ask personal questions until you can feel emotionally that you're able to connect with that person, and you're able to relate with them, and you can kind of get a good fit of kind of, hey, maybe I have a general idea of like, now I know this person, right? So if you see that person in the future again, you're able to relate with that person again and pick up where you, where you left off. So for example, um, at this point in the conversation, let's just say worst possible case scenario, they hang up on you or they slam the door in your face or they just don't want to talk to you anymore. You have enough data to relate to this person in the future. So if you see uh, or follow up with this person in the future, you can immediately pick up where you left off based off these personal things. So think about this. There's thousands of salespeople trying to do exactly what you're doing and they aren't doing this. And if they follow up with somebody, they're initially going back to the pro or yeah, back to the property if, if it's real estate or back to the product and they don't really give a shit about what that person is, is going through in their life. They don't care about that person at all, but you do and you're remembering that, that, that data and that person's gonna be like, hey, wow, this person is remembering um, everything that we had a discussion about. This person actually cares about me and my well-being. Um, so that's not the, the point of that, but the point of what I'm, I'm teaching you guys is Investigation is super important, not just in personal relationship, but also trying to get an understanding of how you can help somebody. So yes, you have personal questions, not too personal where they don't trust you. Um, and then you have business questions. So you wanna slowly, gradually um, jump into asking questions on where you're able to assist that person. So if you think of Walmart, for example, every time you go into Walmart and you see those blue uh, vests and they turn around, it says, hey, how can I help you, right? Um, and that's a huge selling point. So if somebody walks up to one of those employees, they know they can ask them a question about a product and where to find it, and that person's gonna be able to assist them, and they go find that product, and what do they do? They take it off the shelf, they go to the front of the store, and then they buy it. A sale happened just because, hey, how can I help you, right? Um, so yeah, that is a very general question that you can ask to keep it really simple with somebody. It's like, hey, I'm talking to you, how can I help you? Um, and once that relationship is built, they're gonna feel more comfortable with you um, explaining the problems or what they're going through in their life, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, because essentially, anybody that you try to pitch, um, there's gonna be that initial brick wall that you're trying to hammer through, right? It's a lot easier to just jump over this wall instead of just trying to run through it with your head. You're gonna, your head's gonna start bleeding, right? But if you learn how to actually take leaps and, and jump over that, you're able to, to break through that barrier um, and relate to that person and they're gonna be able to open up with you. So yeah, you start asking business questions. So in real estate, it's like, okay, cool. So I see you have a house for sale. Um, what, what's going on? Why do you wanna sell it? Right? You start asking general questions like that. Where are you going to go? How, like, like what, what price point are you trying to, to move to? Or like, what's the goal? Why do you want to move over here? Um, general questions like that where you're able to relate the situation or the problems that they have that, are, that they're telling you after you're asking these questions with their personal life because now you're friends with them. So it's like, okay, I see why you want to move uh, to a different state because your son Johnny lives over there and he has kids. So it sounds like you want to be closer to your family. So and essentially what you're doing is you're, if you look at it like a weapon or like a machine gun, um, you're collecting bullets or ammo by, by them answering these questions. Um, so every question that they're answering for you, um, you're collecting ammo because you're gonna use that later on in your pitch. So the more ammo that you're able to collect, the better it is. Um, and essentially, 
there's different types of ammunition that you can collect. And what I tell my sales guys is you can collect BB bullets all day long. So non-valuable uh, questions or non-valuable problems that have nothing to do with uh, the, the solution that you're able to provide for somebody. What you're looking for is sniper bullets, like the long bullets, where they're a you're able to significantly help somebody with just by solving a few questions. Um, so moving on, so you're asking a bunch of questions. And I'm gonna be honest with you guys, a majority of the money that you guys are gonna make in sales is gonna be right here. And remember, we're not even talking about what solutions we can give to these people just yet because we're still asking questions. We're gathering our data and we're gathering our ammunition um, so we can help this person significantly. Um, and yes, the longer bullets that you can find, the more time you're gonna be able to save because you're gonna solve those key few points and problems for that person and then they're gonna wanna do business with you effective immediately. So you have your preliminaries, your, your first impressions, your icebreakers, then you have your investigation where you're asking a bunch of questions about their personal life, getting to know somebody, um, and asking general business questions on what solutions, or I'm sorry, what problems that they have that you're able to assist with. So moving on, um, then you have the third step to the conversation. Can you guys see over here? Yeah. All right. So the third step to the conversation is going to be uh, demonstrating capability. Demonstrate, demonstrate capability. Cool. So. Now we move to the part of the pitch where now we have solutions for their problems. Now remember, if you don't have any or problems, you don't have any solutions. So always remember that because this is the most valuable part of the pitch. The more questions you're able to ask and they're able to answer, the easier this section of the pitch is going to be. So demonstrating capability. Now you're moving into the part of the pitch where you're able to assist with their needs because you know exactly how to solve their problems because you are solution oriented and they told you all the problems that they have and, and what they need from you or what they need in general. And if you're solution oriented, you can solve those problems for somebody and it's gonna click in this, their brain. It's like, wow, this person is very valuable to my life right now. Maybe I should do business with them because all the problems that I told him as a friend, he's able to solve them right now. So demonstrating capability. So you have problems over solutions. Problems over solutions. So you remember those sniper bullets I was telling you guys about? This is where you guys want to kind of lay it out. So the significant problems are the huge pain points that you found right here. Now you're going to solve them. So it's like, okay, I understand you want to move to a different state with your kids because you have grandkids. Um, but how I'm able to assist you with that is I'm able to buy your house, right? Um, and I can just buy it all cash so you can go spend time with your, your, your son, Johnny, and your new grandkids a lot sooner because time is valuable, family is the most important thing in the world, et cetera, et cetera. Just by connecting on certain data like that where you're able to really connect with that person on a personal standpoint because you've built CPR is going to be a lot more effective than just money or data off your product. Because let's face it, um, anybody can go anywhere and buy the product or service that you're representing. They literally can. Um, if they don't want to sell their house to you, they can literally go to Google or call somebody else just because there's a bunch of people reaching out to them, talking to them. And it's not saturated, but a lot of people are in this business where you want to be able to be competitive with them in this manner. Um, so yes, you want to be able to connect with them so they aren't able to go anywhere else. They want to do business with you. They trust you, they like you, they're your friend or your best friend. Um, at this point, and you're able to solve all their problems in a timely manner or whatever solutions that you have for your business or your product. So yes, now you start pitching your product based off of their problems. Now understand something, there's a lot of value add opportunities that you're gonna have depending on the product that you're selling. So in real estate, there's thousands and thousands of different solutions that you can give to people. All of those solutions are 100% irrelevant, and the main reason being is those people don't care. People don't care about anything but themselves and how their life can be better and their families, which is true. So that's why you cater to their problems around those value adds. And basically what I'm expressing to you guys is the less you say, the, the more you make, because this should be the body of your entire pitch. This should be 80% of your entire pitch. The rest of the stuff should be the extra 15 to 20% just because you're listening, right? So the more you can get somebody to talk about their problems, and I keep saying it over and over again, the more solutions you're able to solve cater to them specifically. Um, so 
even though your product has thousands of different value adds or solutions, which is all fine and dandy to make your product or solution really great, um, but you don't have to express all of them at all. You only want to express the ones that cater to that specific individual. Um, and so you want to understand, obviously, your product and what value add you're able to give to somebody. And then you take their general problems that they have, and then you look at your sheet or all the value add you're able to assist with somebody and pick key points in which it's specifically going to tailor to those problems. Because now you have a weapon, and now you're shooting the weapon. So are you going to shoot a BB gun with BB bullets with non-relevant solutions, or are you going to snipe I'm not saying kill people, but snipe your enemy um, and kill them really efficiently. Um, this is kind of what I'm expressing to you guys um, in a manner. So you have demonstrating capability, problems over solutions. Now you're pitching your product based off of the problems that they've already told you and trusted you with in, on that information. All right, so now um, we move to the fourth step to the conversation. Now the fourth step to the conversation is going to be obtaining commitment. Obtain commitment. So and to obtain commitment is kind of to the point of the conversation where you're kind of like sealing the deal, right? So you're, you're trying to get a verbal understanding and level to an understanding where you guys agree at that certain standpoint. Um, but before I move into this, um, we're going to take a quick break. Um, be sure to like, comment, and we'll be right back with you guys. The Propelio Academy, an all-in-one education resource for training in wholesales, subject to wraps, short sales, flips, rentals, burr, property management, and more. Go to propelio.com slash academy to get your scholarship today. Propelio.com. What does Propelio offer? Lead generating websites. Access to true MLS comps. Off-market lead lists and deal alerts. Get them all today at Propelio.com. All right, guys, welcome back. Um, as promised, we're going to continue on where we left off on obtaining commitment. So this part of the conversation is essentially we're going to start closing the deal. Um, so I what I want you guys to understand is the newest salesperson or the person that's inexperienced, they're going to start using step three and step four before even step one, right? Um, and remember how I told you this was 80% of the entire body of the pitch? They're using this as 80% of the entire pitch up here, and they haven't even connected with anybody. So when they go in for the close, um, you're not emotionally connected with somebody. You're not there on the same page. Um, they don't trust you. And there's a lot of different variables on why that doesn't work. Um, and basically it kind of looks like this. So the traditional manner, it's like we buy houses, right? So the brand new wholesaler, the brand new investor is going to call somebody or talk to somebody be like, as soon as they approach, it's like, this is how much I can give you for your house. And this is how I can do it, right? This is how much I can give you for your house. And this is how I can do it for this reason. And this reason, and that reason, and this reason, trying to pull all the different value out, uh, the value adds out of thin air and trying to connect with that person. They're just shooting BBs and it's not efficient. They're not even aiming at their target, right? So now since we have their solutions and their problems, we're able to specifically aim to our target and be efficient with closing the deal. Um, because remember, we know exactly what problems that they have. We know how to specifically help them in a timely manner and make it convenient for them or whatever value add you have for that customer. So obtaining commitment. Yes, this is where you close the deal. Close the deal. So I even have friends that they tell me where they have a system where they just shoot offers to people, right? They just send them contracts. They just send them agreements and that, hey, it's successful if it's a numbers game, right? But now I'm gonna teach you guys how to be really efficient with that and close more deals with the amount of leads that you guys are currently have. Um, so when you go to close the deal, you, the first and foremost thing is you wanna be able to connect with that person in a yes manner, right? So um, throughout this entire pitch, you're connecting with this person and giving them yes or yes questions like, right? So you guys, if you hang out with me a lot, I'm always like, right, 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 right. I'm making people agree with what I'm saying. So by the time I get to this point in the conversation, they're already agreeing with me, right? So this is going to be the best deal possible, right? Right. And because they said yes to me a hundred times previously, they're going to say yes to me the hundred and one time. Um, that's just how it works. So you get them in the yes manner, right? So you're shaking your head. 
Yes, 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 yes. Uh, but obviously you have to believe in your product too, um, which is a, a different topic, but this is just the body of the pitch. Um, so moving on, so yes, you agree to the product. Let's go ahead and get this done. Here's the agreement, sign here, right? It's pretty simple. Now you don't want to overcomplicate this process because remember, you've connected on those specific valid points. Um, so obtaining commitment, you close the deal, and then once you close the deal, then you have the fifth step to the conversation. Um, which is super important and in my business I find it very like one of the most important parts is because you can get as many contracts as possible but um, when you connect with people on an emotional standpoint you're gonna have people that have uh, like uh, like buyers remorse essentially so you don't want deals to fall apart um, just because they agree to something obt you obtain that commitment um, uh, and have them verbally commit to you, but they don't sign the actual document. Because when you go to rehash, uh, this is where you reassure them on how you're solving the problems and what problems you're solving. So we call this rehash. So rehash, yes. So you reassure, you reassure them, you re-answer, oops. So you re-answer their questions. So you reassure them, um, like, hey, these are the problems I'm solving for you, and this is why I'm going to solve them. Do you have any questions, right? So you want to get those questions out of them on that initial conversation so you don't hang up on them or leave that conversation, and then they go have buyer's remorse, and they have all these questions, and the questions are just essentially objections that you weren't able to solve. Um, this is really valuable because at this point in the conversation, they're going to give you all the objections and all the questions that they have. And it's very important to get as many um, objections out of that person as possible because the only thing an objection is is going to be um, a problem to solve, right? It's going to be another solution that you're going to be able to give to somebody. So you're never going to know what objections they have unless you ask. And I'm not saying, hey, what objections do you have? It's, hey, what other questions do you have? Right? So they're going to have questions the majority of the time, especially big deals where it's a big decision, like a property, they're probably going to have questions, right? Uh, how does this work? When do I get paid? When is closing, right? Uh, like, how am I going to get the money? Or like, what else is next? What's next? They're you don't know what questions they're going to have until you ask, right? So you don't want to go and reassure them with all the value ads that you think are amazing that they don't give a shit about, right? You want to find the value ads in which they have questions over, right? So ask what questions they have and just leave it at that and let them unload. Um, and they will tell you what questions they have because they trust you, remember, because of CPR. So once they start asking the questions, you solve the questions, or you answer the questions with the solution, and then you go back into the yes mode. Fantastic, right? Fantastic, right? This is great. Okay, cool, let's move it on. Go ahead and sign right here, right? Um, so you get them back into that yes mode. And I'm gonna show you how to do that in the, in the next step. Um, so you wanna reassure, uh, you wanna re-answer their questions, and then obviously you want to recap the entire uh, scenario with them. Recap. So, once they have no more questions, what you should have is a signed document or a sale, right? Or you've already uh, had them sign it and closing the deal, but you reassured that entire uh, process with them, and now they're even more comfortable, right? Um, so, it's kind of like sealing the bag. You're really sealing tight that entire transaction to make sure it doesn't fall apart when you leave. Um, because remember, we're really connecting with these people on an emotional standpoint. You don't want people to have commission or uh, uh, buyer's remorse. So when you recap with them, you just go over the entire process, specifically on their needs and how it's going to work to make it convenient for them. And you have to keep it really simple, right? Because if you overcomplicate that process, and what I see a lot of gurus teaching people, and what I see a lot of new salespeople doing because they're excited, um, the the messier messier it gets because the more questions they're going to have. So if you keep it really short and sweet. Like, remember what I said is the less you say, the more you're going to make. Just keep it really short and sweet and simple and just move on. So think about this. When you order an Uber, um, you don't have who's, who's my driver, what's their rating, or how many drives do they have, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, you can find all that data if you need it, but the driver is just going to come to your house and pick you up. No questions asked, right? You want to have the same type of approach and just keep it simple with your customers. Um, and I believe the biggest reason in real estate is why people overcomplicate things is just because of how big of a transaction uh, it is and how much money they're going to potentially make. But remember, it's still a product. Just like if you're going to go to a convenience store and buy chips, it's the same thing. It's a product. You have to keep it simple. 
And once you don't keep it simple, then you're just gonna create more objections from the customer that isn't necessary by overcomplicating it. So just recap off of the solutions and reassure them and continue to reassure them like, yes, this is great, this is fantastic, this is how we're gonna do this, et cetera, et cetera, and just leave it at that. And then you go back to the simple fact of building that CPR, getting to know that person, becoming their best friend, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, just to recap with you guys, we have the five factors of, uh, I'm sorry, this isn't the five factors of impulse, this is the five uh, steps to the conversation. Five steps to convo. Sorry, the five factors of impulse is gonna be the next topic I'm talking about, but this is the five steps to the conversation. So you have preliminaries, um, your opening, and then you have your investigation. This is where you're gathering as much data as you possibly can, quality data, quality problems. And then you have demonstrating capability where you solve those quality problems with your sniper bullets. And then you have obtained commitment. Then you go shoot the gun, right? You, you hit your target and you kill them or try to, right? But the goal is to close the deal. Um, and then you have your rehash and then you're just picking up your dead meat right? and then taking it back in the back of the pickup truck and going to eat it, right? So um, this is gonna be the five steps of the conversation. This is what I use in, in my sales training when we say train new acquisitions, new training uh, for salespeople, regardless of what division of the company it is or regardless of what product. I use this in my old sales company, I use this in my new sales company, I'm gonna to continue to use it in the future because it works. Um, so remember, the less you say, the more you make, CPR is huge, and then the five uh, steps of the conversation. All right, so if you guys have any questions about this process, um, just go ahead and drop your questions into uh, the question bar there, and then I'll get to it when I get time or in front of a computer, but I'm just gonna go ahead and erase a lot of this data. All right, so moving on. Cool. All right, so the next thing I wanna talk about is going to be the closing triangle is what we call it. So the closing triangle. Closing objection triangle is what it's called. All right, so how this is gonna work, what you're gonna to have to understand is people are gonna have objections when you go to try to sell them a product. Everybody is, and if they don't give you objections, it's probably gonna to be too good to be true or it's gonna be like a home run deal, right? So remember, the less you say, the more you make. It could happen maybe one out of a thousand times, but they're there. The majority of the time, they're gonna have objections. So what you guys have to understand about objections, they're actually an amazing thing because once people give you an objection, what you have to understand is people are listening to you, right? Um, they're trying to make this deal work in their brain and for some reason there's something that's not clicking for them. They have a question or an objection where they think it's not gonna work. So it's a good thing because once they give you objections, they're giving you an opportunity to overcome them and a lot of new salespeople, they never even overcome them. They just hang up or move on to the next person and they just waste that entire lead. So I'm gonna teach you guys how to be really efficient with overcoming these objections and how to do that. So we call this the objection triangle. So you have your sale, right? You're, the goal is obviously to close the deal. Um, but when you're going to close the deal or even when you're opening the deal, you're gonna have uh, an objection, right? Um, so you go going to close the deal and then all of a sudden, boom, an objection. So how you overcome an objection is with a rebuttal. And then you go right back into where you left off without any lag or wait time. And I would say on average, on um, a traditional deal, we see about six to 10 objections per uh, transaction. So you need to have your book of rebuttals, and no, I don't have a book of rebuttal for you, unfortunately. I'm sure your sales leader or somebody that you personally know or you can go on YouTube or something and find rebuttals because I don't know what product you're selling. But you wanna have prepared rebuttals for each objection that they have. So, for example, when you go to close a deal and they give you an objection and it's just a question or something that they think it's not gonna work, what you're gonna do is automatically you're gonna overcome that objection with the solution and rebuttal and then go back into closing the deal. So. Um, when you go to close the deal, it's like, oh, I don't want to do it because the price doesn't work, right? Uh, and then how you're going to overcome that with the rebuttal, it's like the price does work. I'm giving you the highest price I possibly can or anybody can. Let's go ahead and do this, right? And then you close the deal. You got to keep it really simple. So you're overcoming their objection with the uh, rebuttal and going back into the closing. Um, where a lot of new people mess up is they hear the objection, they either shut down and don't continue and move on to the next person, which is great for you because now you know how to overcome that. Um, or they go into the rebuttal, they rebuttal that, and then they just wait for that person to respond, 
and give them another objection. So it's okay, I overcame that objection with the rebuttal and then I'm quiet and I don't say anything and all the person's gonna do is think of another objection to give you. Um, that's exactly what's gonna happen. But if you continue to go back into the closing or where you left off in the pitch, it's gonna be really effective because they're not gonna have time to think of another objection. They're gonna continue to agree of, hey, this is the best deal possible. Um, so this is called the closing objection triangle. So this works in the opening of the pitch and the closing of the pitch. Because when you go to open in a pitch, a uh, majority of the time people don't want to deal with you. They don't want to. They don't have time or whatever. Um, especially if you're doing outbound uh, marketing, um, you're approaching them. So this is going to help really efficient with you, especially if you're like cold calling, et cetera, et cetera. Is you have to overcome those objections as fast as possible with rebuttal and go back into the pitch. So for example, if you're cold calling somebody and they call and be like, I, I don't have time right now. You say, Hey, this is only going to take a sec. What your name, right? And then you go back into where you left off in the pitch, and they're not going to have time to remember of that initial objection they gave you because, especially in the opening, a majority of the time in the opening objections, it's all bullshit and lies. Um, so we have this saying, buyers are liars or sellers are liars, because they are. Um, the initial objections that you get aren't the real objection. Um, now, what I want you guys to understand is this right here, six to 10 objections, because this is true, but typically there's one or two main objections that they have that they're never gonna tell you until you get through the entire process of the pitch when they trust you. The goal is to find those real objections that they have on not doing business with you and make sure you have that data so you have that solution for that person and overcome that and go back into the pitch and close the deal. Um, and if you never find those real objections and you just give up on the first couple in the opening, you're never gonna find them because they're lying to you. They don't wanna talk to you. They don't have any interest of doing anything. But the goal is, is obviously to close the deal and get through that entire pitch in a timely manner so you can be able to develop that relationship. So yeah, you're gonna use it six to 10 times in the opening, six to 10 times in the closing. It doesn't matter. There could be a million objections, which is just problems to solve, right? The more problems you're able to solve, the more money that you're gonna make. And you hear that all the time, but this is a real thing. Uh, when people give you objections, you have to look forward to those and be prepared to overcome that with this closing triangle. Um, so if you have any questions about that, just go ahead and drop it into the, the comments um, and we'll continue to discuss it. All right, so you have your five steps to the conversation. So if you relate this back to your steps, right? So you have one, two, three, four, five. So you have your prelims, you have your investigation, then you have your demonstrating capability, you have your obtained commitment, and then you have your rehash, right? So somebody could give you three objections here, four objections here, and one objection here, right? This could be the real objection because now you've made it all the way to the closing. So when you're trying to build that relationship with somebody, that is a pitch. The goal is to be their friend first, right? Um, and they're gonna give you objections because they don't wanna talk to you. The goal is to get through that initial pitch on becoming their friend. And you need the objection triangle because you're gonna overcome those first three objections in the opening. Be like, I don't have time, talk to somebody else, I don't wanna sell or whatever. To now, hey, I understand that, okay, cool. How are you? Where are you from? How many kids do you have? Or what do you like to do for fun, right? You push your way um, to develop that standpoint to find that common ground as fast as possible, but you still have to understand the closing triangle because just because these people give you three objections right here doesn't mean it's a bad deal. Um, the goal is to get through the entire body of the pitch and be able to track that data so you can get better at it. Um, so yeah, you have three objections up here, four objections here. Um, you're best friends now, so they're listening to you demonstrate capability. You're obtaining commitment, they give you four objections. You overcome those objections, cool, they're about to sign the document, and then they, you find the real objection that they actually have, and then you overcome that objection, and then they actually sign the documents because you follow the closing triangle. So, um, you're gonna have triangles that look like this throughout your entire pitch, and then boom money right so it, it's kind of like a like a like a like a, a maze right it, if you look at it from a, a scientific manner or however you want to look at it right so you have your closing triangle and all aspects of the pitch does that make sense so <laughs> it just looks like this throughout the entire pitch and all you're doing is solving these problems and moving on to the next one you see how this works boom moving on and then boom and then you finally make money because you've overcome all these objections with the closing triangle. So 
Obviously, you want to be prepared with your rebuttals and collect that data when they have objections. Write the objections down because if you aren't able to solve it on the fly, I guarantee you if you write it down and you solve it and when you lose the deal, you're not going to lose it the next time, right? So you're learning from your mistakes. You're not going to be perfect at this up front, but I'm telling you, if you guys formulate your pitches into this manner, it's going to be a lot more efficient for you. Um, a lot of, like I said, a lot of brand new people are all the way up there. They're collecting all these objections up here and then they aren't able to initiate that trust factor to find that real objection which is the most valuable so this one objection is going to make you the most money which you guys have to understand is finding that one objection the one or two objections that is a real objection and that is going to make you the deal that's going to solve the initial problem that they have from doing business with you and then they're going to trust you and then they're going to want to do the deal all right so we're going to take a quick break real fast. Once we come back, we're going to go over the uh, next steps of the conversation. I'm um, just hanging with us. The Propelio Academy, an all-in-one education resource for training in wholesales, subject to wraps, short sales, flips, rentals, burr, property management, and more. Go to propelio.com slash academy to get your scholarship today. Propelio.com. What does Propelio offer? Lead generating websites. Access to true MLS comps. Off market lead lists. And deal alerts. Get them all today at Propelio.com. All right, welcome back, guys. Um, we're gonna go over some uh, um, initial uh, sales tactics with you guys. So I, we call this the five factors of impulse. So this is gonna be the five factors of impulse. Um, this fact, these, this uh, essentially, it's just kind of clear and straight to the point on what this process is gonna do for you guys. Um, you're, you're essentially getting people to emotionally move on impulse versus having to think about stuff uh, by scientifically getting into their emotions on a certain manner on how you conduct yourself and what you present to somebody. And I'm going to go and explain that. Now, this has worked for me ever since I started in sales. And through history, it's continued to work for all the great sales leaders, um, all the leaders, the most powerful people in the world were salespeople. And they, even they use these tactics when they negotiate deals um, and convince people to do things. All right, so we call this the JB Fit. JB Fit. It's an acronym. Um, and it's pretty simple. So we have Jones Effect. Jones Effect. So basically what Jones Effect is, it is um, basically you're able to relate success from a different sale um, or somebody else's sale in your office or in your company or in the business, and you relate that uh, success back to that person's, uh, um, to, to that initial person. So for example, um, when I was growing up, um, we lived in a, a house with my mom, my stepdad ended up getting a, a hot tub in the backyard. So the following week, I go outside, and our neighbor all of a sudden is getting a hot tub too. Um, what is that called? It's called Jones Effect. Uh, our neighbor saw that we have a hot tub, we're enjoying it, and now he wants the hot tub too. It, it's actually a very uh, scientific thing that, it, that works in sales. Um, so for example, if you look at the NFL, you have to understand people in the NFL aren't all millionaires. Um, somebody could have a locker directly next to Drew Brees and is just like an entry-level starter and they make like 200, 300 grand a year. Um, while Drew Brees makes however millions of dollars that he makes, but they still are in the same locker room, they surround yourself with each other, and they compete with each other in a lot of ways just because they're professionals at competing. Um, so I believe that's why a majority of NFL players go, end up going broke because they're trying to compete um, with, materialist, or with material items with individuals in their locker room or people in their influence. Um, because it's Jones effect. They see somebody buying something and then all of a sudden they want it too, right? So it works like a referral basis. That's why referrals work really good is because all of a sudden somebody bought a house from you and that person told me you bought the house, I know you can do it, now I want to do business with you. That's called Jones effect. Uh, but there's ways you can implement that into your pitch to automatically um, make people believe, hey, you have this specific problem. Sally Mae down the street had that same problem, and now she's off to the races with all the cash she has in her pocket because I was able to help her, right? 
Um, and you really want to build that relationship with people and get into people's personal networks and personal areas um, so you can find realistic examples, especially if you're doing investing on high scale, where it's just like, I'm a developer in this neighborhood. I actually bought the house right across the street. They're like, oh, wow, he must pay top dollar because he bought the one across the street. Same thing, right? Um, implement Jones effect into your pitch. Uh, relate success from different sales and different uh, solutions that you gave for other people to that one person. Uh, the next one's going to be be the expert. So be the expert. So, <clears throat> for example, if you go to get surgery, if you ever got surgery before, and the doctor comes in the room and they're like, "I've never done this before. You're my first client. You're probably not going to feel comfortable of that doctor doing surgery on you." Um, why is it because he doesn't have experience, right? Uh, how are you going to trust that person through that process if you've never done it before, right? And if you're brand new, it's okay because you can use other people's success on being the expert. It's like we, or uh, me and my friends have flipped hundreds of houses. You're not lying because you probably do have friends on Instagram that bought hundreds of houses or whatever. You know what you're doing, right? So you want to ensure confidence into your pitch and understand that you have to essentially know what you're doing in order for people to trust you. And if you don't, at least act like it with confidence, right? So be the expert. You want to sound like you know the data, you know everything possible, and you're the man for the job, right? Um, don't be the brand new doctor, be the doctor that done thousands of surgeries and then you can just walk in there and walk out like nothing happened because people trust you, right? So you wanna be the expert. The next one is gonna be fear of loss. Fear of loss. So <clears throat> there's actually, if you have cable, you can turn, it, turn on the HSN network and all they do is they sell shit online or on TV all day every day and they've done it for years, generations, right? Why are they still airing that show? It's because it works. And a lot of these factors of impulse, the HSN network uses to the highest extent. So for example, if you're watching any type of info marshal or the HSN network, what you're gonna understand is they use fear of loss pretty significantly. It's like, hey, call within the first 15 minutes and if you call in the next 15 minutes, you're gonna be able to get one free, right? Um, or hey, if you if you buy right now during this during this show or this uh, this info marshal, you're gonna be able to get it at this price, right? That's fear of loss because what people are thinking in their brain is, hey, if I wait too long, then that deal is gonna disappear and then it's gonna cost me more money. Same thing that you want to pitch, uh, implement into your guys' pitch, especially when you're buying houses. Um, one of the main ones we use is, hey, we don't have an unlimited amount of money. We can give you a top dollar for it right now and put this money aside. But hey, if you decide to wait a week, I can't promise that money is going to be there because we're actively looking for a property to invest, right? So automatically the seller is in their brain is going to think, it's like, man, I should take this offer right now because that offer is not going to be there in the future. Um, it's actually pretty funny because a lot of the business that we do is virtually and we have a 24 hour timer avoid on our DocuSign where if they don't sign the document in 24 hours, then it disappears and then they're calling us. It's like, hey, what happened? I was going to sign it. Sorry, man, we need to get it at a less price. I told you I convinced my boss to do it and you didn't want to move on it. Now we have to get it for less, right? And it gives you an opportunity to get it for less, but you're training your clients and customers to move on impulse with fear of loss, right? All right, the next one's gonna be indifference. All right, so basically what indifference is, is confidence in your product and uh, basically understanding that you don't need somebody in order to uh, survive and make a living. So I'm gonna explain a couple different types of salespeople that you're gonna be able to understand and what indifference is. So everybody's been to a shopping mall before or a, a, a large festival or whatever. There's always those peddlers or like the person that's selling makeup or perfume that's bothering the crap out of you and you just wanna punch them in their face, right? Those people are super pushy salespeople. You don't wanna be the pushy salesperson because essentially nobody actually uh, wants to buy anything, right? You have to be able to present yourself on a manner. It's like, I'm really not selling anything. I'm actually just here to present an opportunity for you to take advantage of. I'm here to help you, right? Um, and understand and believe that because you're adding so much value to their life and so many other people. So yeah, you don't wanna be the peddler in the mall where you're just begging people to sell them your house or, or sell their house to you or to buy your product because all of a sudden they're gonna get turned away off that. Now obviously you can have success by being a pushy salesperson. I'm not saying don't follow up, but you have to follow up with a sense of confidence where you don't essentially need that deal to happen because you have so many other opportunities elsewhere. Um, so yeah, it's a level of confidence. There's a big difference between being that pushy salesperson um, and being the person where it's just like, you need me more than I need you. So if you look at it like uh, a relationship, for example, 
um, or you're about to be in a relationship or you're in the dating scene, for example, um, there's, all, there's two types of people. You can be the person that double texts somebody or the, the, you're the type of person that always gets double texted. Who do you think's in, in control? So for example, if the person that you really like and you just blow them up, like constantly send them 16 text messages in a time and they don't read any of them, <laughs> chances are they don't like you, right? But look at on the flip side, if you're the one that's getting 16 text messages and you just don't have time to, to read them because you're so busy, um, then all of a sudden they're in their brain. It's like, man, this person's hard to get. That's exactly what this, this process is, is you're acting hard to get because the harder that you are to get, the more valuable that deal is, right? So if you think of like the hottest girl that you can think of, chances are every guy that's trying to hit her up is constantly blowing up her phone. So you got to do something different eventually in order to get somebody's attention. Um, and this, this has worked dramatically for me in my business career um, because it, it's, it's true. I really don't need you to do business with me because I can go elsewhere and get it all day long, right? So you want to have that level of confidence with people, but it definitely takes time to develop this because a lot of you guys are still brand new. Um, but you do want to be careful with that commission breath where, hey, I'm doing this full time. I need the sale to happen for me to make a living. And people can smell that level of confidence. And it's kind of like you're a begging puppy where they're just like, hey, man, get out of here, right? You want to be that guy. It's like, hey, man, I can make this deal happen right now. Let's do it. And I do this for a bunch of other people. I really don't need you or not. And then like, man, this is this is really hard to get, right? Um, it's it's more so off that confidence level. So if you look at Louis Vuitton, Louis Vuitton, it's I mean, those are pretty expensive handbags and they're kind of hard to get sometimes, right? Because it's expensive versus going to Walmart and getting a, 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 a typical bag. So when you go to Louis Vuitton, the people in Louis Vuitton, it's like, hey man, they lock the stuff up. They don't want you to take it, right? It's all a level of perceived value where they're making their product seem so valuable that it's hard to get. Um, that you actually want it more, right? Um, so it, you have to understand that you are valuable, your business is valuable, the product that you're representing is very valuable, and people need that more than you need them. All right, so the next topic I'm gonna talk about, talk about is take control. Take control. All right, so take control. Um, what you guys have to understand, 97% of individuals, um, especially in the U.S., actually work for somebody else. Um, or, hey, they, their, their spouse tells them to do everything, or they're still a child and their parents tell them to do everything. Ever since we were born and started growing up, we, we were trained to take orders. So if your parents told you to do something, chances are if you didn't do it, you got a spanking, right? Um, and then all of a sudden you're in the working world. If your boss tells you to do something and you don't do it, chances are you're fired, right? Um, if your spouse tells you to do something and you don't do it, chances are you're going to get in an argument and she won't, or he or she won't be around very long, right? So um, the average person is used to taking orders, so you have to implement this into your pitch and take advantage of that situation because you're able to take control of people's decisions, especially when you're on the fence about stuff. So what I mean by that is, for example, when people will be like, oh, I don't, I don't really know. And like, you do know, you're going to make this happen. We're going to get this deal done for you. And then you're going to move with Johnny across the country and have a good life, right? Let's go ahead and do this, right? There's no doubt words in that. I'm telling him exactly what to do and how to do it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you an agreement. You're going to open it while I'm on the phone. Go ahead and do that for me. And you wait. They open the agreement. Okay, let's read through it together. You read through the agreement. Okay, you agree to everything, right? Yes, I do agree. Okay, go ahead and click sign. Sign that for me real quick. Boom. All of a sudden, you told him how to do something, and he did it, and you got a deal. It's really simple. Take control of people. Be the boss. We have this joke in our office where it's like step up and be a boss or boss up. Don't be a pussy or a pansy and just get moved around all day. You have to be that boss because chances are if you're a boss, most bosses are balling, right? Because they learn this aspect. You have to learn how to take control. Take control of conversations. Now, I'm not saying take control of people, but you have to take control of people's decisions because you know it's gonna be good for them. You have to be confident in that. I know for a fact, once you sign this document, I'm gonna add so much value to your life because I'm buying your biggest asset and we're gonna buy it in all cash and you're gonna take that cash and move on and invest it elsewhere and you're gonna be so much more happy. I know that for a fact because I've done it for thousands of people. You can go shop it around all day long. It doesn't make a difference to me because I know for a fact what my op offer is is the best offer that you're going to possibly get, right? So let's relate this back to the HSN network with the five factors of impulse and why this actually works and why it's been working for so long. 
So if you pay attention to the HSN network, and sometimes I actually watch it just because I learn a bunch of stuff because a lot, I mean, it's sales, right? Those are salespeople on the screen. You can learn a lot from that, right? So throughout this entire show and every, and most shows, they implement every single one of these traits on the five factors to the highest extent. So Jones effect, for example, when you're watching um, the HSN network, they have people in the background or they have a commercial where it's somebody using the product, they're so happy, um, or they have, Jessica Simpson on um, talking about proactive, like I use it, it's helped me in my career. If you use this product, you're gonna be famous. That is called Jones Effect, right? It works. Uh, be the expert, right? So they have certain special guests on HSN of the expert of that product, right? They know everything about that product from start to finish and they're explaining that product to the highest extent and you're buying that product from them because they know what they're talking about, right? Fear of loss, they have a little timer at the bottom of the screen, it's so funny, it's like the biggest joke, the, a little timer at the bottom of the screen where it count, it's like a countdown, right? I have a countdown right here, it's funny. Um, a countdown where it's just like, you have to buy this product within this amount of time to get this deal. And they get constantly, constant business because of that little timer. How much money has HSN made because they implemented that timer? How much more money can you make by implementing fear of loss into your business? All right, indifference. For example, oh, no worries, you can't afford $5,000 for this treadmill, that's fine. You could just, we could just take payments for the rest of your life, no big deal, right? That's indifference, right? They're solving a solution, they don't need you because they can, somebody else is gonna buy it, right? Or it's just like, hey, you don't have $5,000, you don't wanna get on payments, hey man, or woman, no big deal. Um, let's just go ahead and get you to set up with a credit card, right? No big deal, right? It's that no big deal approach. Um, take control, cool. Um, a majority of the info marshals you guys see, it says, call right now, call right now. That is a direct approach to take control of people's actions and emotions to make a decision right now. That's exactly what it says, right? Um, it doesn't say, hey, call in the future, maybe you'll buy this, right? Or uh, good luck finding this in stores. It's like, here's the phone number in big letters, and here's call now in big letters, and it says, call right now to take advantage of this deal, right? Move on impulse. This gets people to move on impulse. It works. It's very effective. And I promise if you implement this into your business, you're going to be a lot more successful. All right. So that's what I have for you guys today. Um, just a quick recap with you guys is, yes, everybody's pitch is going to be different, which is okay. You want your pitch to be different than everybody else's because if everybody's pitching people the same, then all of a sudden all people are hearing is the same information, right? Um, I've ran thousands of salespeople before, I've trained thousands of sales individuals, I've helped hundreds and hundreds of people become massively successful with this sales training, and here I am giving it to you for free, and I want you guys to take advantage of that. I want you guys to use this, I want you guys to win. Um, and remember, it's this is just some science and certain points uh, behind actual sales and the dynamics of sales. What you have to understand is sales is a numbers game. So. What I mean by that is it, it might take you 100 people that you're pitching and you might actually get one good lead, right? One good lead, that's a success, right? So now you know if you have one good lead, your KPIs for that is 1%, right? So now you have data to track on. So all you need to implement now is work ethic. So all I have to do is call 1,000 people and I have 10 people interested, right? So now I have 10 people interested. Now let's find the KPIs on closing these actual deals. Cool, out of every 10 interested people, I'm able to close one deal, right? Look at that, so you had to call 1,000 people to get one deal. How hard would you, would you work if you knew for a fact you could close that one person after you called 1,000 people, right? So basically what I'm expressing to you guys is, especially if you're brand new, you don't know your KPIs, you can't just go off the general approach, you have to actually do the job. You actually have to get out there and go start pitching people and go start presenting your opportunity, your service, or your uh, product, and people will take advantage of it after a certain period of numbers, right? But on top of that, as you do more numbers, you're gonna continue to get better and better and better. So if you do it a thousand times, chances are you do it a thousand more times, you're gonna be a lot more efficient and a lot better, and then it's gonna continue to increase. Does that make sense? Um, so basically what I'm gonna leave with you guys today is, um, happy to be on the show. We're actually gonna be hosting a weekly show um, every Thursday at 1 p.m. So book your calendars out because I'm gonna to try to give you as much sauce as I possibly can over the next couple months to help you in your business. Regardless of the product that you're selling, um, real estate's great. Obviously I wanna help you guys significantly with that. We're gonna have shows in the future to help with that. Um, follow me on Instagram, thedonovanruffin.com, or I'm sorry, thedonovanruffin, uh, at thedonovanruffin. 
Um, and I'm sure I'll leave it in comments so you guys can find that. Um, follow me on Facebook. Um, we actually have deals, right? So we do wholesaling around the country. So if you're interested in wholesale deals, reach out to me. I can get you access to those deals. Uh, but once again, I appreciate Propelio for having me on. Um, if you aren't using Propelio service, then um, I don't know what you're doing, but we use it thousands of times per day in my business, especially if you're in Texas. It is a super valuable product. Um, they have leads, they have uh, lists, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and continue watching the rest of these shows that add a ton of value to people. Um, and I continue to respect that and their core values. Um, but as far as that, um, just keep the comments